On today's podcast, we've got a great friend of mine from a long, long time ago from Alaska, Brad Waitman from what lodge are you at? Igiaga Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough name to say, but a great place to stay. <laughs> You're a beauty. Um, anyway, I'd always wanted to go to Alaska once I started trout fishing. And Ernie Schwiebert, the great Ernie Schwiebert, who taught me how to fly cast when I was nine, he used to come back into Aspen. Uh, we used to fish the frying pan and he asked me if I wanted to go to Alaska and I ended up fishing your father-in-law's lodge, uh, Valhalla Lodge, just before you came, a, became a guide there when you're like, I think 20 years old. Is that correct? Yes. And yes. then we did a TV show. I went back when I had sportsman's journal and you were my guide. And yeah. then I don't know how many years after that, we're at the Somerset trade show. I walked into an elevator and who do we have? Yeah. Captain Iggy <laughs> <laughs> Well, we hadn't seen each other for so long, you know. So you know, I think it was 18 years, maybe, maybe, I don't know when the, when, what year we did that show together, but that was a long time. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Spent a whole week together. Yeah, yeah. You know, and now, you know, we've reciprocated over the years. Uh, I've always wanted to take Nikki to Alaska. And when we saw each other at Somerset, he said, you're the tarpon guy. I said, well, I can catch a fish. And I said, I tell you what, why don't you come fish tarpon with me? And Nikki and I hopefully can come catch a big rainbow with you. And so we yeah. put we put the team together and we did that. Yeah. And that was just such an awesome trip. What did you think of Alaska? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, you know, growing up a little bit in, in Aspen, you know, you catch these, you know, a 12-inch trout on a dry fly is like something to be proud of and it is it's fun but it's not like alaska and i've never seen the you know the spawning salmon and the rainbows behind the salmon and you know fly in fly out and i mean come on you got it pretty good and and he wanted you to experience that and i i just really when i i remember i said i said are you still in the tarpon game and you're like you're like oh yeah every year i go down there 30 days a year and i'm like man i'd like to try that and they're like, I like really like my boy up there and, and see Alaska. And I'm like, that's perfect. Right. So and the bears. That's, that's how come I, mean, I I got down here is to, to is to see what this action is about. So Well you just a, you just finished four days. Yeah, tell me tell the audience awesome. what what you experienced. Oh, it's a totally different game, but it's uh I mean it's 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 so exciting to see those 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 silver kings just i mean they're tough they're not easy they, they don't come easy but uh when you do get one it's it's something else i mean they they do everything that i thought they would they launch they run and it's it was a, it was a blast i really appreciate you you know hosting me and taking me out and of course yeah, awesome. well i was i was gonna say it'd be a lot easier if you actually uh fish with a professional guide but you're fishing yeah. with us so i totally just... agree <laughs> <laughs> thanks nikki <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm... actually i think am i wrong was... am i wrong <laughs> no you're not wrong you're totally right it was a blast though i mean it's a blast you know so is there any similarities between rainbow the big rainbow trout fishing and and tarpon fishing down here in any well, way you know what all fish are selective at times you know and everything's just got to be perfect. The placement of the fly has to be perfect. And I think that there is similarities to everything except for a tarpon. Once you hook that thing, it's big game time. So, but uh, our, our our rainbows that we have in Alaska, are, you know, we're sizing the, the rods a little lower than what, what we're using here. And, and they still rip you out to the backing too. And there's still the, the, the whole you know game of not of not of losing a fish you know to keep them on is still the same thing because they jump they run do they get off pretty easily oh they can get off pretty easy yeah usually from and, breaking and off or, or from pulling that, hooks you know what's what's really amazing is i've i've kind of um learned from you about how 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 hard it is to break a 20 uh 20 pound test on a, a big tarpon but i've seen guys snap 15 pound tests on a rainbow i don't know how but every time they do it, I, it, now since I've been down, just my second time down here, I tell them about how could you break off a, a trout on 12, 15 pound test when I, I've landed tarpon on 20. Right. So, yeah. so, well, you know what typically happens? Yeah. People are so anxious to catch that fish. They won't allow that fish to run, to run. away. And they, they get tight and they hang onto it and it hits the end or they try to hold on or palm it too hard and anything that you have you know that 
that kind of a snap motion with monofilm, it's gone. Yeah. Anything that's smooth, you can absolutely pull. I think I think that the the rainbows that we have um, are chromers that come out of Lake Iliomna that are my bread and butter of my business. They they are they're a little bit similar to these tarpon. Now they 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 take screaming runs and jump, and then you know you have to be ready for that energy and you have to let go of the line or let go of the handle of the rod or wherever you have your line. And I think guys, uh, they don't understand, they underestimate the power of a, of a rainbow trout, you know? And when you say chromers, that's just like a total silver so rainbow like, yeah. trout, right? So, like a steelhead. so the rainbows that we have in Lake Iliomna, the, the fish that are my home river fish on the Quijack, um, and Lake Iliamna and all the tributaries that go into Lake Iliamna, which is the largest lake in Alaska. And uh, my my area that I'm I'm in is is known as Bristol Bay, because the 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 Lake Iliamna um, flows out the Quijack goes into uh, Bristol Bay. So all the fish come, all the uh, trout are 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 known as as. Uh, bristol bay trout i guess you would say right. so so they they have the capabilities of going down the quijack up the alagnac into different river systems and they've actually tracked them and and they do do they do kind of migrate around but they generally winter our fish in, in lake iliamna and, and because the the lake is so large it's 80 miles long and 30 miles wide it's almost like an ocean to them so they take on a real uh, chrome look to them. They don't have a lot of spots and colors when they're in the big lake. They don't get any of those colors unless they're either spawning or they come into the rivers. And I believe that it's because of the sunlight that hits them because they're so used to being in the big water where they don't see a lot of sunlight. It brings out the you know, the, the, color, the spots, the, the, the rainbow color that, that they're known for. But those are what we call really omnichromers and so you know before we go any much further if you don't mind um pebble mines was just shut down yeah and pebble mines was going to be in that area i cannot even imagine how scared you were prior well it's still going on and 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 uh i've got a lot of in intimate knowledge about that whole area because uh, at my father-in-law's place where i where i first met you I flew over the the the, the creek that's that's known as uh, Upper Telerik, and it's a combination. It comes out of a couple lakes, but it's also of a, a artesian. It comes out of the ground. There's little you can you can as a pilot, I I, I can fly up a, a creek and I can see that it disappears into the ground. It comes out of the ground. So if you were to go up into an area like that, which is where the headwaters of the upper Telerik and also Pebble Mine, where they're mining air, it's not a mine, we call it it's Pebble Project, but, right. but where they want to build the mine. If they dig into the ground like they, what they're talking about, they'll hit the natural aquifer and dry that creek up. And so what they'll do is they'll transfer the water into the river or to, to you know, uh, keep the CFUs or whatever, CFSs, um, we don't really do much of that up in Alaska because there's no, you know, we don't know what the flows are because they're, they're unhindered. Right. So this would be one of the first times in that area that anything has been messed with, you know. So what they would have to do is transfer the water in order to keep from, from what it was before to keep the flow the same. And when they change that flow of the water and they change the mineral content that's in that creek, the salmon that feed everything in that creek are not going to return because it changes the smell of the river. So uh, Upper Telerik would be ruined itself, without a doubt. So, you know, that's why, that's why I'm against it is because I know that creek would be done. I have no I idea what would happen downstream from there. Right. Well, so, regardless, this is devastating. But, ho but hopefully... It stays in place, and they can't overturn. Well, right now it's right now. right now it's shut down, um, and the governor of uh, Alaska is trying to appeal it right now. Um, the decision that was made by the Army Corps of Engineers, and 
you know, we're still going to fight it. Yeah, we'll cross your yeah. fingers that uh, that never takes yeah. place. Yeah, Captains uh, for Clean Water is, is is another good organization that's 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 spearheading some defense and and Trout Unlimited and you know we're just going to keep fighting. You know, just to remind yeah. everybody, if you are a conservationist and you want to help our resources, and if you're a fisherman, you know, check out Captains for Clean Water. They could really use your help because they are doing some outrageously great work well let's go to a good and, place and actually that's a beautiful thing i'm down here i'm down here where captains of clean water is kind of organized and they do down here in the everglades and sure. yeah the pebble mine yeah so i guess it's natural that i got to keep coming down here and fishing with you right because <laughs> <laughs> i'm very i'm very all, all for conservation are, are yeah because i'm concerned are you begging or are you begging or praying right now <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, let's, let's go to a, a fun place in that. Yep. Um, how does a kid who was born in California end up finding the mindset to become a bush pilot in Alaska? Well, shoot. My, uh, my dad took me, my dad, my dad first got me a, a Christmas present as a guided steelhead trip on the Klamath River. And uh, Klamath River is a famous river um, in Northern California and Southern Oregon. And it's got a, a Incre- it used to have incredible runs of, of salmon and steelhead and we were steelhead fishing and uh you know i didn't know what i wanted to do i was i was young and uh we're we're, we're going down the river in a drift boat and i and i said to the guy I go so you do this for a living and he goes yep that and a little duck hunting i take guys out duck hunting and i went Wow. <laughs> so I was at the age where my dad wanted me to be an engineer or something like that. And I I actually thought I wanted to be a fish and game warden or something like that. I I, I figured that would be an, a, you know, a good opportunity to spend most of my time in the woods, you know. Something in the outdoors. Yes, just yeah. be. I didn't realize at the time that people made a living guiding fishermen but when did you first and, get connected with fishing and fly fishing oh no i i uh I, my father c- couldn't uh satisfy my my uh my desire to go to go fly fishing so we we joined a, a fly fishing club called the peninsula fly fishers and it was a great club because uh they would have a a meeting one they had meetings every week one meeting would be this this week we're going to go here it would be for whatever it was one of the what I'll, I'll just uh talk about the, a shad trip shad very similar to these tarpon they're american shad that run up the the uh um american river is where we were going to fish which is part of the uh um the the that whole um sacramento river system and uh uh, we I, I, we would go there and somebody would do a presentation on what kind of what uh, American shad was, and then you kind of get your juices flowing. And you're like, oh yeah, I want to kept I want to go do that. So you go to the next week, and then we would learn to tie what kind of flies that we we're going to use to catch those American shad, and what kind of lines that we used, which we used shooting heads and different different sink rates. And then the next week would be after we somebody would probably bring some smoked shad in or something like that. They'd say, yeah, they taste good too. And you'd have some, you know, on a cracker or something. It was, it just really got you going. And then the next trip was, uh, or the next week when we had the meeting, it would be a, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, organization meeting. We decide who's going with who and in what truck or whatever. We'd all meet up and and we decide how we're gonna. To, to all just join together and do this fishing trip. And uh, um, and then the following week, which is the fourth week, we, it would be on a weekend, we'd go fishing. And and the, the this particular, well, I'm glad I, I mentioned this, is, is uh, one of the guys that was there, um, he saw this young kid that's really into fly fishing. He goes, there's some cheap labor right there. And he ended up calling me a few, a few weeks later and says, hey, I'm opening up a fly shop in San Mateo called Angler's Emporium. He goes, would you like to work for me? And I said, are you kidding me? That's way better than making pizzas or something else like that. <laughs> so I worked for him at the fly shop and and then I started going to uh, uh, well, this, uh, the San Mateo Sportsman's Exposition, what was it called, the SEI or? Um, or SEI. Yeah, yeah. And it was, um, um, 
it was uh, ran by uh, Ed Rice, I guess. It was a long time ago. Sportsman's Expositions. Uh, and uh, um, I, w- I would sit in the front and tie flies in, in the booth. And one of the guys that was next door was a, a guide on the Deschutes River. And I don't know why he took a shine to me, but he goes, hey, kid, he goes, you want to go fishing on the Deschutes? And I go, I'd love to. And he said, you tie me up seven dozen uh, sofa pillow flies, I'll take you on a, a, a fishing trip. So I did, and I was really excited. When I went there, um, they kind of just let me stay. And they said, hey, call and see if you can stay. You could be a swamper on a on a on uh, the baggage boat. Because what we did is we did four and five day float trips down the Deschutes. And I would be on the baggage boat and set up camp and everything. And the guys would come down in the drift boats. And it was a great way to get my foot in the door. And I just, that was it. And uh, um, th- they were the ones that really got me uh, to come to Alaska because they said the future of guiding was Alaska. But how did you get connected <clears throat> with planes? Well, I now, mean, was that, was, okay, there, was so, there any so the fear first year, involved so, with that? So the first year I got to Alaska. Um, I mean, you look like Tom Cruise. Tell me that. It, uh, yeah. you know, so the first year I got to Alaska, none of the lodges up there really fly fished a whole lot. It was mostly spin fishing and, and, and uh, you know, for kings, they're using eggs and things like that. And I was, you know, coming from a fly fishing shop, fly fishing, uh, you know, uh, shop that I was working at, tying flies. That was my game. I was a fly fisherman. And uh, um, I remember I was, uh, you know, the guy was like, he's a fly fishing guy. And one of the guys that I kind of, I really look up to, even today, said, "I don't know how to fly fish, but I can fly." And I thought that I was 19 when my first year in Alaska, and I go, "Man, that guy's at the top of the food chain." And I just, it was just something that just naturally happened. I mean, when you get in the airplanes and you see that, I just knew I could do it. I wanted to do it, so I took everything that I made that first year. I made $750 a month. I got everything taken out of my paycheck. If I wanted a soda, because I remember when I first got there, the, the, my, uh, my boss would ask me, he goes, you like to, you like to drink soda pop with lunches? Because we're going to send out the shore lunch. And if you, you want a soda pop, just let us know. And I said, yeah, I might like a pop. He goes, okay, you wrote down one pop. Then he said, how about candy bars? You like candy bars? Oh, he was deducting. I don't really like it. <laughs> Charging a double. <laughs> he literally said, do you like, do bugs bother you? And I go, well, I don't know. I go, you know, I had to, I had to actually go to the bathroom. I was camped on the river out there. I mean, I never went back to, to the uh, lodge. And, and it was, you know what? I would have done it for free over and over again because it was my first year in alaska was the best experience i've ever had i mean i got there and the first my first thing i did is i took a boat up the uh the new shigak river system 120 miles or there's eight it and and uh you know i all i had was a map and it, it, take the right fork here and the left fork there and just wide-eyed i mean i was just loving it the sense of adventure that i had was uh you know, irreplaceable in my life. So I didn't care how much I made, even though he took out everything, all the pops, all the, <laughs> all the candy bars and everything. So you, like uh, you said, you were working for free and it was okay. Yeah. So I took, but I did make a few bucks and I took everything that I, that I made and I went to uh, Vern Air and uh, at Merrill Field in Anchorage and, and, and uh, signed up for a private pilot course. And, uh, you know, I sold it in four hours and, you know, I just kept getting my ratings and, 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 uh, you know, that's kind of how it all started. I, I, you know, that, that for me, that was what I, that, that's what I wanted. Actually, what I really wanted was to own my own lodge. But at that time, when you're 19, you're thinking that's never going to happen. So, but. And so you, you became a, a really successful guide with black bears, moose, and caribou, correct? Big game guide. Well, what? you know, once I got, I had always hunted with my father and 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 uh, for everything, and we 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 you know we'd hunt pheasants, we'd hunt ducks, um, mule deer, blacktail, everything. 
It, but uh, when I got up to Alaska, I saw the big game, like moose, caribou, uh, grizzly bears. For me, you know, uh, the grizzly bears was the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's something that can eat you, right? So I, I, I just kind of, I just kind of wanted to hunt them at that time. You know, I was just like, wow, that's the ultimate. And I kind of, I kind of followed that line too. I, I decided that I wanted to, to, to become a big game guide. And that actually um, kind of uh, took over. The fishing became easy because I'd always done that. And big game guiding was, uh, was something that I was ve very new at. And it was, I never, you know, I never, I, I, I always wanted to, to um, you know, prove myself because it, it's a totally different deal from going out fishing. I mean, you go out fishing, you, you know, you hook a few, don't hook a few, it doesn't matter. But, it, you know, tomorrow's another day, right? But, but in the big game guiding thing, when you're getting paid to take somebody on a, on a, on a hunt, um, success is important and, um, um, you know, taking a small animal or something that's not a trophy is, 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 you know, it's not, it's not acceptable. So it, it kind of raised me to a higher plane of, uh, of, uh, discipline, I guess you'd have to say, because once you pull the trigger, it's pretty permanent. So what was the scariest part of bear hunting? You know, chasing a wounded animal. What, you maybe? know what? It, what the the thing is is when you have the mentality of of, of someone who wants to be a pilot, you're in charge. You're you, you crave responsibility, right? So so uh, I mean, I I've been charged a few times, um, you, you know. But uh, being the one that's in charge, you just take you just take control of the situation. So. You know, I think I think that's the other thing that's that's also. But you make I that. But you make that sound easier than than reality. I mean, you're dealing with an animal that can kill you. What was the scariest moment? Well, I'm not going to. You know, what? none of them were very scary. Uh, um, there's a there's a certain sense of calm when you're the one that's responsible for the situation. For me. For but the problem reason. is you're dealing with a hunter who may make so, a bad shot. So I, 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 yeah, and I, and I've, I've thought a couple, I, there's been a couple charges that I'll, I'll tell you one. And this is, this guy was actually very good. He was a, um, he was a, a, a radiologist. So he looks at, at, uh, you know, x-rays and stuff. And, and, you know, you and I, I don't know how good you are looking at an x-ray. I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at. But he's he was excellent at at spotting game. I was I, I always tell people that I go radiologists are really good at spotting game because they scan the area with the, where most of the time when you're hunting bears you stay in one place and you look all over the place for for something that wasn't there before because because it, it it may not just be a critter crawl because they don't just walk all the time they just may be laying in the corner or something else like that and he was really good at spotting game. At any rate, we we uh, so I have a lot of respect for that um, because he constantly constantly was looking. He wasn't just waiting for me to spot something. So it was a, a nice camaraderie because he's glassing, I'm glassing. We, you, you know, you look at something, you go, "What about that over there?" If you don't see a few bear rocks or bear bushes, you're not looking hard enough, right? So because you know you want to pick apart everything, and you you break out your spotting glass and you you zoom it and you go, "Nah." That's not, you know, nothing. But at any rate, we found this uh, grizzly bear and he had to come down the hill and, just, and he found a, a, a ground squirrel marmot or whatever you want to call it that we have in Alaska. And they have little holes that they dig into the side of the hill. And this bear started digging after this, this uh, ground squirrel. And, and he, it was an inland grizzly. So it's, it, you know, they're not giant. And I said, all right, that's, he was on a combination grizzly caribou hunt. And I said, you want that one? And he goes, he goes, yeah, let's go after that one. That'd be cool. And so, cause it was a decent bear. It was probably eight foot, which is not bad for a, a inland grizzly and beautiful, beautiful uh, bear. At any rate, we get up on it and, and it starts digging. It had his shoulders all the way into the ground. And I, and at that time you could just go straight towards him cause it's so preoccupied. 
So we get to a, a point downhill of them um, that was uh, the right distance. We didn't need to get any closer. And uh, I, I said, when he pops his head out and turns a little bit, you know, take your shot. So he did. He, and he kind of tumbled the bear and the bear, you know, gets up and starts running. And then he commences to miss him three times. And then he stands up because I'd already set him on, a, a, you know, a little bit of a, a of a rest. But he stands up and he says, I'm out of rounds. Oh, and no. I go and the bear sees you. He he well, he, he was almost on a straight line to us. But he made a perfectly straight line to him, and he kept coming. And I'm thinking, this guy's standing here. And I just, you know, calmly just did what I he had to do. It, yeah. yeah, we're 15 feet away. Holy you know? cow. And, and the guy, he goes, you know, I was never nervous for a minute. And I thought, if I wasn't there. <laughs> you would have been you nervous. Th you think you would have been <laughs> His underwear, so that, his underwear would have been very dirty. Yeah, so that was... Uh, you know, normally, whenever an animal is afraid, they're going to try to run downhill, That's or wounded especially. So, But, uh, yeah, so... You know that what? Was, you, that was the one where where I felt that if I hadn't have been there, you know, been things would have... It probably wouldn't have been so good. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're all really conscious of, of what's taking place, you know, uh, with our resources. Yeah. And we've always, so when you go back in history in the 1800s, you had all the planes, the American planes filled with thousands and thousands of buffalo. Alaska was filled with thousands and thousands of caribou. And you watched that herd dwindle. Tell me about, you know, that evolution. But the, the caribou herds. Oh, okay. So our particular caribou, so bears, we, we haven't had a problem with. Bears are a predator. They're staying pretty strong. Um, our caribou have hurt really bad in my area. Um, Molchatna herd of caribou used to be the place everybody would go. We used to do um, a caribou combo fishing trip at, at, at uh, my father-in-law's place. And he'd drop me off because, you know, you, you we're not going to keep an airplane out there and come back the next day. And somebody could get a caribou and really good eating meat. Um, but... You know, the, this is a natural thing that happened with those caribou. They, they got a lot of, uh, um, they didn't eat themselves out. There's so much tundra out in that country. They got a lot of, of different parasites. They're such a social animal. Um, so, uh, so warbles. Disease? Disease. War, disease took them out, yeah. They, they got um, different things like warbles. They got... Um, uh, there's a hoof and mouth type thing and stuff like that. So, I mean, that, that happens and it could be, it, they could, they could rebuild, but it probably won't be in our lifetime. Right. You know, so there's cycles that happen. That's a natural cycle. Who knows why, you know? Well, in the last, I mean, I think I can speak with you two for you two, but like the last 10, 12 years, we got really into hunting and I think it's maybe, um, you know, ranked higher in our priority list than fishing the last couple of years because it's so exciting and we love it. And a big part of it is, you know, the whole experience from when you take the animal down to processing it to, um, you know, grinding the meat, all of the above. Right. And especially, you know, when you take home fresh organic Absolutely. wild meat, that's like my favorite. That's, yeah. that's the best part for me. And so I get like the moose hunting, the caribou hunting and all of that. But for me... I, I guess my question is for you, killing a big brown bear. Did you guys? Did you have any mixed emotions, or was there just so and many? And just... so, so the brown bears was just something that I, I, I yeah. There's mixed emotions um, because for sure, ninety nine percent of the but, hunters that kill know, them, they don't eat. But not to sidetrack it, what I really think that you would love, because I know you guys, is sheep hunting. And, and oh I well, mean, of you course, guys, yeah, yeah, that's a given. Because because. You know, I'm too old, but I he's totally too understand young. what you're saying. I mean, I, you know, the the brown bears are we don't eat them, and so you know, I, I I did it when I was younger, and I don't really care that much if I do it anymore. But if I had a chance to go sheep hunting in a second, right? I mean, I even tried to eat. I, I heard about calf fries. I mean, I don't even you know you know what calf fries are. 
uh, sheep uh, testicles. Well, well, that's what I was trying to try to make out of them. And, <laughs> <laughs> but they make <laughs> they make them out of, of, of calf balls, right? But I tried to make them out of the the because sh- everything on a doll sheep is good. It's it's the kind of meat that doesn't need to be aged a day. So we'd always take the inside tenderloins, the back straps, the, the, the hindquarters and front shoulders, you know, you don't need to eat that right away. But it, immediately, when, when you're sheep hunting, you take almost nothing. I mean, when you, when you meet, as a guide, when I'd meet my hunter, I'd go, will you have a toothbrush? And he'd go, yeah. And i go, okay, I'll leave mine here. Just, just- <laughs> Just to so, keep your just yeah, to keep your packs to keep very the light. weight down yeah. because wow. you're gonna your your plan is to come back with, with some, some weight right so you don't want to make multiple trips in the in that kind of country but you guys know from you know your 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 time in in Colorado the mountains are it, it's that's that's the place I love to be but doll sheep itself is such a good eating meat so when you collect the when you collect a trophy. And I mean, you know, you have the opportunity to look for those old, those old rams that are, you know, 11, 13 years, you know, a good full curl and some, uh, man, and then you get one and they're so good eating. So, and it's not that brown bears aren't, are, you know, aren't bad to eat, but it's, they're filled and littered with trignosis. Right. Um, well, I mean, everything kind of tastes like what they eat. And they eat carrion and dead things, rotten fish. You know, it, it, you know, even black bears can be good eating if they're eating blueberries. But if they're if they're eating fish out of a river and, and whatnot, uh, I mean, I don't, they just don't taste that well. So you have to mask the flavor. But a, but a doll sheep moose is also really good. So, and I know you're going moose hunting in Alaska. Oh, I can't wait. I should tax you. Because I, I, <laughs> yeah, no, because you set me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me a chunk. Because, so, boy, so, it's so, so good. So, tell us about moose hunting. Well, moose hunting, I mean, you know, the, 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 the story of moose hunting is the fun stops after the animal drops. So, oh, wow, I can't imagine. <laughs> Yeah. So Nikki said, so Nikki was, you know, Seven he, he's, trips. he's got these big aspirations of, you know, harvesting a moose in Alaska. And so he called yeah. you and you found somebody that, you know, got him keyed on to somebody that's, you know, in the know, it's going to drop right. him off. They're going to float 150 miles and try to harvest one with a bow. And if not, they, they're going to, you know, take a rifle, but it's 150 miles. 10 by days. Half, 10 days. And Nikki says, Okay, I got the operation. I got it all figured out. This is what it is. You want to go? Yeah. I said, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> He's letting me be the guinea pig. I said, I go once again, you're right. too young and I'm too but old. I, you know, when I brought up the doll sheep thing, I'm, I'm looking to see if you're game on that. Oh, you? no. Oh, man. <laughs> Hell, I can't pull a boat. It, well, it, it, you it, pull it, pretty four good. Four feet of water at a twenty mile an hour. But wind. you know that's that, that's one of the reasons why I kind of love the fish and lodge business is because you know I still have my registered guide license. I take hunters out at will, but I, I kind of had to pick and choose what I wanted to do, and and I'm really really glad that I had all the experiences with the big game hunting in in Alaska because I got to see so much. You know, from the goat, we didn't even talk about goats. I mean, uh, forget T- it. Tell us about goats. No, you don't want to do goats. Do, tell us about a goat. <laughs> well, Why goats, don't I want to do a well, goat? Well, goats have a little thing where they like to, you know, have one dying wish where they make you almost kill yourself getting them. So, so they, they, they die yeah. on, a, on the edge oh, of the cliff. Oh, they, they, there's some uncanny way that they have of not staying put. So, and, and I have quite a few friends that have been hurt really you know, falling off to, a, a trying ledges. to recover the, the 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 client's animal so they, they live in very steep country and oftentimes it won't be you know necessarily uh any worse than some of the sheep hills but they live with grassy rotten slopes and and just you start Slippery. sliding you you don't stop till you hit something hard so but that is i mean anytime you're up there where the weather comes in and, and you see a cloud and that cloud com- completely completely envelops you 
you know, you take a time out because you're like, oh, all right, we got to just sit here and wait till we can do something because we can't see anything right now. Right. You know. And I and and for me, I just love that. I love that that to be in, up at some elevation. So, who, who are your heroes, if there were any, in Alaska? You know, as far as bush pilots. Oh man, and there's so many of them. These guys. I mean, like in, my in, father, in the world of saltwater fly well, fishing. So my father-in-law, have... well, the world. Exactly. Who would be yours? Well, we have so many people that were really inspiring. You know, yeah. Joe Brooks, Lefty Cray, Flip Pallet, you know, Stu Apt, uh, Steve yeah. Huff. Who were those guys in your world? You know, there's there's a list of them. Um, and I'd have to say almost every single one of them were big game guides, pilots that started fishing lodges later because they didn't realize that there was that much business for being in the fishing business. Because in the, in the, in the old days, in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, hunting was the only real game in Alaska that, that people would come up for. And um, I really look up to the guys that the, um, were the bush pilot. Uh, guides the guys that that, that that took the hunters out in their own super cubs that went across and i mean we're getting back to stuff like polar bears which you know people could say whatever they want about that hunt but that hunt talk about adventure they went so far across the the the, the frozen sea ice looking for open leads where these polar bears would be feeding on seals that would so come out. So an open lead is a crack in the ice yeah. with water. Yeah, with water. Okay. Where, the, where, the, where the seals, seals would could come get out. Up. Yeah. And, and these guys were doing it before we had GPSs, before we had any of that stuff. There was, there, it was them, and they always, mostly pe- uh, went in, in pairs. So there's two cubs, so at least somebody could, could help them. But, you know, I look back at my, my, uh, my my wife's grandfather uh, ward gay we have all of his old films and it's so cool to watch because they would try to attract these hunters to come up not just for polar bears but everything else and and uh, in the in first class back in the old days on dry, flying up to alaska is not what it's like now I mean, they're carving turkeys and prime rib right there in first class. It's it's crazy when you see what first class flying to Alaska was, and and they were trying to attract people to come up here and and you know do the big game guides or big game hunting. One of the big things was polar bear, and so these you know these guys would would they would put themselves into the situation where the guides were taking care of them. They're hoping they're taking care of them. And they did, the most of them all are really good guys. And there are few of them are still around. And one of them is Bill Sims. I really look up to him. He, he, uh, he's, he's, he was one, my boss for several years. He, he, uh, he was one of, he, he was actually younger when he got into the polar bear game because they outlined that in 1972. So it really wasn't the hunt for the polar bear or any of that stuff that, that, that I really look up to him about. It was that whole um, hardship, the toughness that they had to have to do that. Because I don't think you understand when you were just sitting here, you know, how tough that is to be you know, 150 miles across the sea ice with no um, navigational, um, you know, equipment except for a whiskey com- compass on your on your dash to get you back. And it was so cold that these guys would actually have to empty the oil out of their airplane and bring it into one of the uh, locals' you know, little houses that would put them up because they didn't have lodges. They would they would make a deal with somebody that lived up there local. They could crash on their on their on their couch or whatever, and they'd keep the oil inside, and they'd put it on the stove or whatever in the morning. Pour it back in the airplane. And go out. Go back out. Would the oil freeze if they didn't? Oh, it would get so thick they it, could. It, it would wouldn't. Work. It would. It would not. Uh, wow. Go, yeah. So that I mean, if oil gets too thick in anything, as you know, it it, it the won't. Viscosity. Yeah. 
In those days, we they didn't even have multi viscosity. So anyhow, th- th- those kind of guys. When I see the uh, my wife's uh, grandfather's videos, I I look at the equipment that they or the the clothing that they're wearing. You can't believe it. It's nothing like we have. No synthetics. It was wool. Everything, which is great. But but uh, we've kind of gone back to wool. Yeah, wool, wool is great. Yeah, merino wool is my favorite. Do you watch too. the TV show Life Below Zero? At um, all? Not much about these people in Alaska that that live yeah. up there and live off the land. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if is I that believe any of that. Bunch of <laughs> <laughs> No, I how about, I, you how know, about I, naked and afraid? You watch that I one? Really, I, I really swear, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, I mean, I'm only 57, so I really wish I could line you guys up with some of these guys because I'm telling you what, I mean, the stories. They're the, these, what you asked me, the guys that I, that I look up to, the guys that I, that, that, that somewhat mentored me at times, like Bill Sims. Um, the, you know, I just, I, I, you know, Ron Hayes is another guy. He's got incredible stories. My father-in-law, uh, um, uh, Kirk A, Larry Rivers. Um, I worked for years for Sam Fegis. He's still hard in the game. Um, Gus Lamoureux, um, he learned from his father on, uh, hunted Kodiak Island for the big Kodiak bears. Um, that was, that was a, a good experience, uh. All those guys have so many stories to tell. Um, it just, I mean, it, 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 it's multifaceted. I mean, it's fishing, hunting, right. flying, sure. survival. And I mean, we didn't even get into uh, mechanical failures, which we don't like to call it crashes. It's just a but mechanical they're crashes. <laughs> <laughs> People die. In no, crashes. no, no. They, none of these they guys had, did. <laughs> no, they, they didn't. But yeah, it what, so what kind of fear is there being a bush pilot with weather closing in? I mean, we were fishing a couple of years ago up there and we couldn't get to where we went, it went yeah. where we wanted to go. And um, that was a little hairy. For, you know, for, for, think, us, for us, us. It yeah, for him. For us. No, I think it's it's very similar to you guys on the ocean too, right? I mean, you know, it, it it's it's just a different aspect. I mean, I'm I'm in the air. I'm there's only really one person that's in control of the right. situation, but um, you just have to you just have to always know where your out is, right? And keep your out in sight, you know. Sure. So because uh, you lose sight. You lose your... A, a 180 is a good turn to make. <laughs> <laughs> it, no matter what you do, that's taking you back home, right? So <laughs> To a pillow. <laughs> well, cabin. there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you got to know how far to stick your nose in anything. It doesn't matter if it's the ocean. It doesn't matter if it's white water going up a river. I mean, that's that's a whole other thing that's a... That's a, a I mean, it's it's something that we, all all of us, three of us here, right here, we we love that. That's the juice, right? Right. That makes us feel alive. That's why we get out there all the time. We don't get that on the couch. We don't get that walking down the sidewalk. We don't get that going any place. But but we, but let me ask you this. So you're, you know, at twenty, you were up there, and you were hunting big bears and moose. Uh, and as a fishing guide, the element of danger is non-existent and you're no longer hunting the big game and you're a lodge owner, very, a very successful lodge owner. And by the way, I love your lodge because I've traveled around the world for a long time and I hate going to a lodge where I have to have dinner with 30 people at night. Right. Your lodge is outrageous in the fact that you only host six people. The, your dinners, yeah. your food is five star. It's quaint and intimate. And that's what makes your lodge as great as it is. But with that being said, it's an entertainment business. The adventures of flying, okay, you've got that refined. You go to the lodge, you take people fishing. Yep. Is, there, is there any sort of remorse that... The older we get and the more wise we've become, we've lost the world of innocence. Mm-hmm. And I would think as an early bush pilot, innocence and, and um, 
and the newness of what you're doing is electrifying. But now all of a sudden, since you've, you're so refined with your lodge, it's an entertainment business. Do you still get excited about doing what you do? Absolutely. It's just like, you know, I was thinking about today when we went out there and it's like, how much time do we give it? Cause they're not coming right now. Right. The, the, the tarpon aren't running. We got, we had them coming in strong. I mean, right. lines is, of, I don't know, maybe 70, maybe more. And that's exciting. Right. Well, they weren't there a few minutes ago. We didn't know they were going to show up. So anytime you spend out there, no matter what you're doing, fishing, hunting, whatever, you don't know what's going to change on a dime. Right. It's the and, unknown. Yeah. That's why, you know, he knows it. And you had to, you know, it's like he wants to stay out there and see it all. He'll stay there till dark because he, you know, he hasn't experienced everything yet. Well, when he so, gets to be my age, he's going to realize that the winds are high, the fish right? are swimming in deeper water. Well, I'm never going to see another eyeball. <laughs> Meanwhile, but, you're in the front of the boat, not but, pushing. But you so. know what I mean. What, what my, not, the whole point of your of your question was is is you know is it's still exciting, and and I I always start the day and go to everybody. I go. Man, I can't wait to know what the story's going to be tonight when we all get home. Right. You know, because there's, we have no idea. That is what I love about this, this, this outdoor entertainment game of fishing and, and, and hunting is because it's, it's, it's not even really planable. You know, we 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 think we ho- there's we, a lot of hope involved. You know, there's hope, but but so many variables, right? And it's just the best. I mean, it's just the best for me. It, it, it I, I, I can't think of, of, of any other thing I'd lo- rather be doing in my life. I mean, this is where my heart and soul is, is being outside. I mean, just today, you guys saw, I saw that sunrise. I mean, and I'm thinking people are going to say, oh, I took a sunrise picture. I don't know how many sunrises I'm going to get to see. That in was a, Florida. That was a night <laughs> <session for that. laughs> But there's no mountains around. <laughs> but, you know, I just, I just, I just, I, I look for it every day. I, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always upbeat for, for the next day because I know it could be something special could happen that's never, there's always going to be things that never happened before, you know? Well, you're like you're, you you're, getting a bite. Tarpon bite. Yeah. <laughs> or like, or what I, and, and down here, I mean, in my, my, you know, things get hectic and you get excited and your, your line wraps around your A shirt. Button. And stuff. <laughs> no, you know what, you know, what's really fun is to see you in your element and to yeah. see you down here a little bit out of your element because, right. you know, my father and I come to Alaska and we're, you fly us in your, in your, in your cub to this remote river and we go right. down there and we're hiking down and we see this, this, brown bear in the middle of the river chasing salmon and right. I immediately got my phone out and i'm looking at my dad like holy shit this is unbelievable yeah it's real and you're, and you're just <laughs> yeah. and you're you don't even look you just you're hiking down to the river right. and, and you go well, you know, hold on and you, and you go down and we see these these sockeye and you're like all right so there's gonna be rainbows right behind the sockeye and i'm like my eyes are huge i can't wait i'm like yeah. i'm so excited and you're yeah. like there he is right there and you have it down like clockwork and you know we catch a few fish and we walk up river and there's more bears and we're like unbelievable and that's like an everyday thing for you and then you yeah. come down here and you kind of participate this in what is your game yeah <laughs> our game a little bit oh yeah and we've seen it a bunch but to see you on the bow waiting for a string to come down the beach and to see your excitement it, it's the newness, like what you were saying. It's just fun to see the right. innocence. Yeah. yeah. At our age, oh, man. there's not a lot of innocence. And you're right. shaking and you're casting. You make a couple bad casts and you make a couple great casts and you're in it. And it's right. just the whole camaraderie, you know, just to see you in your element and then out of your element. Yeah. It's just been fun. No, I, I, I'm really happy that I got to, to spend time with you two today. I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time with Andy. He's, he's intense. I mean, but, uh, 
I like to see him. What do get you mean on, intense? I, I like to see him get on you a little bit. You know, <laughs> so, what do we, no, and he's this is his game. He knows what to do. He expects me and, and holds me to a little higher plane. He wants me to do exactly what I'm what he's what I need to do, which I don't know what that is. So it's it's a learning curve. You know what I mean? So well, you know, and, what, and, and, he, and when when he's in the back pulling. He wants that fish so bad, and he knows what line he would take, and and he just it, it everything happens so fast. He's telling it to me, and I'm trying to you know, I'm trying to put it into motion. I, I'm catching and, that fish through and, you. It's exactly, and 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 I love it. You know, it's it, but I get frustrated a little bit because I'm you know I'm so new at it. You know, and, oh, and, for and, sure. And, and when I and you're an accomplished fly fisherman, but it's hard yeah. with a twenty mile an hour. Yeah, you know. But I'll tell you what: when even when 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 it all comes together, I mean, for a brief minute, you think you have your stuff wired, right? Even if I know it might be a fluke, but when I <laughs> <laughs> when I get them to when I when I'm able to do the the, the, the strip doodle. the yeah. strip just right. And I get them to peel out and come over. It's it's like anything else that I do. Only it's tarpon, which I've never fished for before. And it was it, it's 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 really addicting. Really, it is. I mean, it's something that you know you want to do again. Did you, know? did you have any meltdowns while you were here? Did I? Only when he got too intense with me. <laughs> we had him coming from all directions. I needed to put a mouth guard and a, and a helmet on. And, and he's on the left, on the right. <laughs> he's like, I don't know where to go. <laughs> I need something to eat. I guess I'm low blood sugar. <laughs> but it was a blast. That was the but, day that I that I hooked up on three. And I mean, I'll tell you what. It's, it's you know, I'm talking about my Alaska stuff. And now going back to these tarpon. I mean, when I when you get when you get that hookup, it's 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 it, I can't even believe that that I got the I I was able to do it. Uh, I felt I did it okay. It's I mean, a, because you did great. I I you know you gave me the good advice of clearing the line when because when that line is coming out and you got it coiled in the boat, stuff could go wrong really quick. I mean, if there's a little knot in anything. That's it. It's going to get caught up on the guides and he's gone. That 10 so, seconds when you hook up yeah. to a fish is just electrifying. And you guys don't fish with heavy stuff. I mean, th your stuff is light. Yeah. So that's why I lost one of them. Well, you, oh, you're blaming it, my dad. <laughs> no, I, it, no, I mean, he, he just, he, you got to fish the light stuff sometimes, right? I mean, well, you know, that's part of the story. We're fishing inside IGFA, you know, yeah. um, confines, 20 pound yep. test or less. And that's, uh, that's, that's, that's str very strong stuff. And you're going to, with 20 pound monofilament, the world record is 202 pound fish. You know what? It's I like have fishing with absolutely rope. no problem playing that game. Yes. Because it's doable. And it's I, ethical. It's ethical and it's I sporty. have no problem. It's sporting. You know, it's like the first the first good hookup I got. I jumped him. He ran. You got a great jump pitcher across my, my shoulder. That was, that's, and then he, then he got off. But I got the best. And and I know he's he's swimming strong. Oh, he's fine. And I yes. could care less really if I get him to the hand. Honestly, of course I said that. And if he was a hundred and eighty pounder, I'd change my mind. Yeah, for sure. But but uh, <laughs> well, it's no, all it's... good. And Brad, I just got to tell you, you know, we really are very connected in so many ways yeah. with you know our passions uh, for fishing and hunting and. Yeah. Uh, and I love your sense of freedom and adventure being a bush pilot in Alaska and what you've done at 20 years old. You were a guide for your uh, father-in-law and you got your own business, a very successful business. And if I were to ever go to Alaska again, I'm gonna go to your lodge because it's, it's so perfect with only six people and the great fishing that you guys have there. Yeah. And well, I just want to thank you so much for hey, everything you've given us. Absolutely. Thank you for taking me into your part of the world. <laughs> it's a little hot down here, though. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, you're the All best, right, man. You thank you. Thank you, bud. <laughs> Love you, you man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Love thank you. What a so it's just a ride. What a so.